we do it for that and other reasons. Uh, but I will say that a finished product is a much simpler thing. As an example, Germany sends us cars. We send them cars, they practically don't take them. I mean, how many Chevrolets do you see in the middle of Berlin? Not too many, folks. <laughs> Not too many. Uh, but they send Mercedes, they send BMW, they send them over here in tremendous numbers. Uh, Japan sends us tremendous numbers of cars. They also make cars here. And the way there's no tax, all they have to do, Mike, is very simple. They do a factory here, there's no tax. Now all of a sudden there's no tax. So they'll build factories here in order to avoid the tax. But with cars, with television sets, with things like that, <laughs> where they're dumping them on us. We don't make television sets anymore in this country. They come from South Korea, and they come from, to a lesser extent, Japan. Most of them come from South Korea. It's not fair. And I believe that we should have reciprocal taxes on that, likewise. That's a different product. That's a much simpler — you know, we did it with the washing machines, as you saw a couple of weeks ago. It's had a huge impact on that industry, a huge impact. And by the way, you know what's happening? The people that made the washing machines outside of this country are now expanding their factories in the United States so they don't have to pay the 25 and 30 percent tax. And the same thing's happening with the solar panels. Uh, we're starting to make — we had 32 companies. I think we're down, Gary, to two, right? We made solar panels. But every one of our companies was wiped out. And I have to say this, and this is agreed to by — we made a much higher quality, a much better solar panel. We make them better, but we couldn't compete. Now — and we've had a lot of good things. A lot of, a lot of places are opening up. They're starting to make solar panels again. So with a finished product, it's a little bit different. But again, with steel and aluminum, which is what we're talking about today, you know, it's, good. it's a good point, Mike. You're right. Uh, the question is, would you rather pay a little bit more and create <coughs> jobs all over the country? Uh, and it's possible you won't be creating Really, you won't — you won't be having much of a problem in terms of pricing, because I actually think a lot of the countries are going to eat it because they want to continue to, you know, export, and they're making a fortune. Look, we have rebuilt China. We have rebuilt a lot of — with the money they've taken out of the United States. We're like the piggy bank that had people running it that didn't know what the hell they were doing. And we have rebuilt countries, like, massively. You look at some of these countries, Look at South Korea. Look at Japan. Look at so many countries. And then we defend them on top of everything else. So we defend Saudi Arabia. They pay us a fraction of what it costs. We defend Japan. We defend South Korea. They pay us a fraction of what it costs. And we're talking to all of those countries about that, because it's not fair that we defend them and they pay us a fraction of the cost of that defense. Separate argument, but a real problem. Uh, Gary, would you like to say something? Thank you, Mr. President. We have Senator Brown, Senator Peters, Senator Casey, so you've got a good collection from the Finance Committee and the Commerce Committee. I just make two points really quickly, Mr. President. The first, yesterday you all released the infrastructure plan, and I looked at it very carefully, and I couldn't see even any incentives, let alone requirements to use American steel. Now, Senator Brown, I think, always says this is a great opportunity for bipartisanship. If we can work with you on that one, that ought to be a no-brainer. We can. And there's one other thing on that point, very President, I'll be, be very brief. And that is, actually, with respect to American steel, the way the plan reads now, it actually allows the states to walk back from commitments to use American steel. So point one would be, could we work with you on that? Point two is uh, the Secretary and Ambassador Lighthizer have been um, very forthcoming in working with us, but we have been trying to see this 232 report, and we appreciate your asking us for our, our advice. We will need to see that report in order to give you more specifics. But I come back to Senator Brown's point. I think there's an opportunity for real bipartisanship here, and those would be two areas. I agree, and I'd like you to come back with a suggestion on infrastructure and the plan, and I think that's a bipartisan plan. I will tell you, uh, when I approved the two pipelines, the Keystone and, you know, we did the two big ones. And when I approved them, I said, where's the steel being made? And they told me a location that did not make me happy. 
And I wrote down that from now on, steel is being made for the pipelines. As you know, it's got to be made in the United States. And it's got to be fabricated in the United States. And so I'm a believer in that also. Uh, but if you would come back with a suggestion, that would be great. Uh, Bob, what about 232? Well, I think we can put out a report. I, but the rather focus on that, let me just say, I want to sort of second what the senator says. Trade has always been bipartisan in this country, and just until the last few years. And I really think with this and with NAFTA and the other things we're doing, we can have Democrats and Republicans vote in large numbers together and start a new, a new way to approach this. That really is the point that I wanted to make. I think Senator Biden and I think Senator Brown feels exactly. And Senator Casey. Can I, can I speak on that too? I, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, for, uh, thank you. I very much appreciate the work that Ambassador Lighthizer has done uh, generally and specifically on 232 and Secretary Ross's work on 232. And, and I want to talk for a moment about NAFTA, not too much, but Secretary Lighthizer, Ambassador Lighthizer has been so good in that. I mean, trade, trade, as he says, has always been nonpartisan. And I think good evidence of that is what Senator Portman, uh, my colleague from Cincinnati, I'm from Cleveland, what we've been able to do together on on the Level the Playing Field Act, on trade remedy, on trade enforcement, on currency, and right. most recently on um, Clyde, Ohio, on the washing machine case. And we appreciate what you've done here. Uh, I sent the president the transition staff uh, three days after the election, sent him a letter outlining what we could do together in trade. The president, thank you, sent back a nice handwritten note about that. I appreciate working together on everything from TPP to non-market economy status to 232, to the washing machine case, uh, to all of those issues. And um, I asked in the washing machine case, it's 3,000 jobs in a small town in Northwest Ohio, you know, an hour away from Toledo. So that right. really matters to a lot of families. Um, I'm hopeful we can do quick action on 232. Uh, I, I, it needs to be comprehensive, aimed, as Todd said, certainly at China, but beyond China, 232 needs to apply more broadly. Uh, I, and I also, I will just conclude that we can, we can work on NAFTA together. It will, I will work if NAFTA is written in a way that supports workers, as I'm confident it will be, with Ambassador Lighthizer's uh, handprints on it, that, um, that we can deliver Democratic support. It will be bipartisan if done right, and um, that's my reputation, and that's what I'll continue to fight Good. for. And I know Senator Weidman, Senator Casey, and Senator Peters Good. are on board with that. I actually think that we could go bipartisan on infrastructure, maybe even more so than we can on DACA. Because the difference is we want to help DACA, you don't. Okay? I'm kidding. I'm sure you do. I hope we can. By the way, while we're at a table, I hope we can do DACA. That's currently up. Everybody's in there working hard on it right now. I think we have a chance to do DACA very bipartisan. I think that can happen. And I hope we're going to be able to do that, Senator. And I think we will. On infrastructure, which is the purpose of what we're doing today, uh, come back with a proposal. We put in our bid. Come back with a proposal. We have a lot of people that are great Republicans that want something to happen. We have to rebuild our country. You know, I said yesterday, we've spent $7 trillion. When I say spent, and I mean wasted, not to mention all of the lives, most importantly, and everything else. But we've spent $7 trillion as a about two months ago in the Middle East. Seven trillion dollars. And if you want to borrow two dollars to build a road someplace, including your state, the great state of Ohio, if you want to build a road, if you want to build a tunnel or a bridge or fix a bridge, because so many of them are in bad shape, you can't do it. And yet we spent seven trillion dollars in the Middle East. Explain, we'll, explain we'll that one. We'll have a bipartisan agreement. We have a bipartisan proposal. We have a proposal. We can do it real fast. dollars on it in infrastructure. We're glad to we can do it there, fast. work together on a real infrastructure bill with yeah. real dollars plus what you can leverage in the communities right. and the private sector. Do a combination. It needs, it needs real dollars. I, I would love to have you get back to us quickly because we can do this quickly and we have to rebuild our country. We have to rebuild our roads and our bridges and our tunnels. So the faster you get back, the faster we can move. Focus on DACA this week, if you don't mind, right? But the faster you get back, the faster we move. Jackie, you were going to say? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. Grateful um, for your willingness to sit down and listen to, and just talk today. But I represent the recreational vehicle industry in northern Indiana, Elkhart County. We have 85% of that market. And I'm, and, and I'm a defense hawk. I get what you're saying. I get what we're all saying around this table. We're one of the largest manufacturing districts in this country. And the problem is right now, even the mere, when we look at balance and we talk about balance, the mere threat of tariffs right now 
from some of my folks that are manufacturing right now, they employ some 15,000 people just in my district in Indiana. And uh, a guy, one of my uh, guys called me this morning, said the mere threat of tariffs right now has already raised aluminum and steel costs by 25%. Canadian um, softwood has raised 20%. The labor cost to the industry is already up 10 to 15% because the job market's so tight. And this is a market that was 21% unemployment when we really had a financial crisis in this country. And now we're down to 2.1%. Their concern, my concern, is if, if we seriously have a balanced effort and be able to keep and retain the momentum in a place like northern Indiana and be fair at the same time, I am 100% supportive of what you've done. I would just ask that you look at that balance of what it's doing to current employees and giant growth that our tax reform helped just two months ago. But what you have to ask your manufacturers, sure. too, and I know some of those manufacturers, yeah. they were great to me. Yeah. And yeah. they're friends, and they voted, and they, they're great people. But you have to ask them one question. When you build your product, and you send that big, beautiful product that they make like nobody else, and you send that to another country, how much tax does that other country charge them? And therefore, they don't sell it there very much because the tax is so high. And one of the things we want to do is we want fairness. We don't want what's been having. Because you look at it, and you do well here. But they come in, and they compete with you, and we take their product for nothing. And you want to sell your product overseas, which is probably triple the market for you if you ever could get it. But a lot of our manufacturers have given up. <coughs> They've given up on that. They, they don't even talk. I, I would tell you, Harley-Davidson, I was saying, well, what's the story? They were saying it's a 75 and 100 percent tax. They got used to it for so many years. It's so many years. They weren't even asking me to do this. I mean, I'm doing it for them and others. But they weren't even asking because they've gotten used to it. And your folks have gotten used to it, too. Because you take that great product and you sell it overseas, they make it almost impossible for you to do that. Not only monetarily with the tax, but they also have other criteria which make it impossible. I understand. But I would, uh, I would say, Mr. President, there's also the second issue that has developed in this country with these corporations and, and producing the quality uh, vehicles that they do is the true American smelters left, and in reference to the costs here, they won't even fill the products of some of these customers because they don't have to, because they got people standing in line to buy, okay. and there's so few, right? Good. So if you can't buy the specs, you're out of a job. Yeah, no, I agree. We want a combination of big competition, right. including competition from within our country, right. competing against them. And we want to take outside sources, but we want competition and we want the jobs. And the customer service. Absolutely. And we want customer service. That's right. Any you. questions? Yes, Senator Lamar. Mr. President, thank you so much for. Uh, How's health care going? Good. Thanks. Good. That's thanks what for, I hear. Thank you for your support That's and for sticking with us. I talked to Senator Murray about it uh, Good. earlier. We're making progress. Good. Thank you very much. And thanks to the Vice President for his work on that. Uh, if, if I could use uh, two 60 second stories, just I don't know exactly what the tariff is proposed, and I thank you for having us down here before you've made your decision. That's a big help. I thank you for that. So here are the two examples. I hope you will look carefully at, at what President George W. Bush did in 2002 when he imposed 30% steel tariffs, 30% increase on tariffs from China, South Korea, a couple of other places. The effect was, one, that even though that was only 5% of the imported steel, it raised the price of almost all steel in the United States. Two, um, at the same time, um, uh, auto parts manufacturers who used the steel um, began to cut jobs and move outside of our country because they could buy the steel there, make the part, and ship the part back in without any tariff. And we found there were 10 times as many people in steel using industries as there were in steel producing industries. And so according to the auto manufacturers, they lost more jobs than exist in the steel industry. <coughs> so that's, so the questions would be, will it raise prices? Lamar, it didn't work for Bush, but nothing worked for Bush. <laughs> well, no, it didn't work for Bush, but it worked for others. It did work for others. But you're right, it did not work well, for it's, Bush. It's a, it's something, I'm, I, I'm not recommending any solution. I'm just saying it's worth looking at what happened because it backfired, raised prices, and lost jobs. And then my, the other 60-second story is my dad worked for Alcoa in the smelting plant in 
in Tennessee. We don't have smelting plants for aluminum anymore because you, you have to use a lot of electricity to make them, and they're never coming back, really. I think we only have six left. So 